I mentioned that I was going to meet up with Joshua, Mr. Scratch's former handler, and that is what I did. We had agreed to meet at 12 noon at his place. Now, I am not a shy person at all. I mean, I used to be, but that's a past long behind me. Even though I consider myself to be rather brave, I admit my fingers were shaking a little when I pressed them down on Joshua's doorbell. About ten seconds later, a lady in what looked to be her late thirties opened the door for me. She eyed me up and down before sighing deeply and pushing the door wide open, motioning for me to come in. You must be from that wretched park, she grunted. Come on in. Joshua's waiting for you in the living room, she said. I offered her a polite smile as I stepped inside the house, which she promptly ignored. She then pointed at a doorway ahead, and I walked past her into the living room of a small cottage-style home. While it did look rather cozy, I noticed a general sickliness hanging over the interior. Every single piece of furniture somehow managed to look worn and tired in its own special way. The place reminded me a lot of what I would feel like entering my grandparents' home as a kid. It felt like a place that would belong to an elderly person, not a couple in their thirties. Next to the couch in front of the TV, which was humming away on some low volume, was a man sitting in a wheelchair. Upon noticing me, he waved me over, flashing me a wide, warm smile. Well, hello there, he exclaimed cheerfully. Would you look at that? And here I was, thinking I'd never see any of the doomed souls slaving away at that park ever again, he said in a happy, joking voice. But in light of recent events, I couldn't help but shudder a little bit. Joshua, I assume, I said, offering him my hand. He grabbed it firmly and gave it a firm shake, which I admit I did not really expect from his rather gentle appearance. Then again, this man used to be a monster tamer for many years before me, so I guess it's just natural that he has a lot of leftover strength. Exactly, young lady. You know, I don't think that park has had a female monster tamer before, he thought out loud his voice trailing off pensively. Oh well, guess there's a first time for everything, right? And judging by that handshake of yours, you're probably doing just fine, he said, chuckled, and then reached to pat me on the shoulder. Please, have a seat, right here, he said. He pointed to the edge of the couch, next to his wheelchair, and I sat down. I instantly sank, about ten inches deeper, as the old weary cushion gave in underneath me. So, um, Joshua said, as he took a deep breath and leaned forward, what can I do for you? He asked. My eyes then traveled down his body to the two stumps left of his legs. One was a bit longer than the other, but both ended just above where the knee would have been. The former tamer must have noticed it, since he grinned and said, Ah, I should have known. I turned my head, mumbling an apology for staring so impolitely. I don't mind. Stare at them all you want, he said. So, um, I've been trying to find out about the non-actor's origins. My co-workers and I have been doing quite a lot of research, I said, finding myself unsure how to describe how I felt about his missing legs. It's hard to believe that Mr. Scratch did this, I finally muttered. Joshua then nodded. I know, right? He had always been so friendly. He really does grow on one, doesn't he? By the way, excuse my wife's icy demeanor. To her, everything that has to do with that park is evil. It took me long enough to convince her to let you come over. To her, the park is where her husband lost his legs and nothing else, he said. And to you, I asked, what is the park to you? He then smiled. It's where I spent eight years of my life working. I am still very fond of it in a way, and admittedly, 
I miss Mr. Scratch. Even though he ate like 30% of my body, I don't hold any grudges against him. I don't even think he knew what he was doing, he said. So, I inquired, curiously leaning over to him. How did it happen? I asked. Joshua then grinned broadly. Sit back, girlie, for you are about to hear a most tragic tale, he said in a very dramatic voice, making me giggle a little bit. It was a day like any other. I came in early to feed Mr. Scratch and, you know, play with him a little bit. I remember meeting Dale on the way and talking to him. I've known Dale for a very long time. I even knew the manager before him. That was his dad, by the way. Two years into me working there, his old man retired and Dale filled his position. The two of them were really alike back then. But if you ask me, Dale is even solier than him. Anyway, I came in, let the big guy out of his cage, and all goes according to plan. Then the visitors start flooding the park, and from then on, everything goes completely wrong all of a sudden. I don't know why, but that day, there were just some real jerks among them. Some of the kids began to hop around Mr. Scratch, and they were kind of pulling on his fur and shouting like crazy at him. I tried to scare them off a little bit, but they just stuck around. Visitors are not allowed to touch us, and it was already like that back then. But those kids apparently did not care, and neither did their parents. Sure, they were kids, and the visitors all think Mr. Scratch is some guy in a costume, so I guess they didn't mean any harm. But I noticed he was getting very uncomfortable. He was trembling a little bit and just had this nervous vibe to him. Still, I obviously couldn't drop the front, so I tried to get away from them as far as possible, but, well, no luck in that. When those brats finally got a move on, Scratchy was so nervous and jumpy that I thought I'd better take him back to his shelter, where it would be a little bit quieter so he could relax, you know. Thankfully, there were no visitors around the funhouse next to Mr. Scratch's cage. There were renovations going on there, so that part of the section was closed off completely. There were these few blockers where it was fenced off, so nobody saw what happened to me, he said. Joshua's smile had slowly faded. He then swallowed audibly. I led him behind the view blockers. It was completely deserted. Once behind the fencing, I let him off his leash, and that is where I made my mistake. I accidentally dropped the leash and had to step forward to pick it up. I was a bit tired myself, so I must have overlooked that Mr. Scratch had suddenly placed his paw in my way. Next thing I knew, he lets out a howl of pain, and I realized that I was standing on his paw. Tense and nervous as he was already, this must have been what gave him the rest. He completely lost it. It's all a blur. I was completely overwhelmed when it happened. I felt his teeth dig into my leg. He flung me up in the air, but I didn't fall back down. He caught me by my other leg, and I felt his fangs sink deeper and deeper into my flesh. And then there was this crunching sound, and the pain was absolutely blinding. It was only for a few seconds. Then I lost consciousness. I came to in the hospital. My wife was there, and so was Dale. I remember my wife yelling at him with tears in her eyes. He lied to the medical staff, told them that I had had an accident at the renovation site, probably had given them some money too. At least I believe he did. No one ever asked me any questions. My wife later said she wanted to try and file a lawsuit or something, but I told her to leave the park alone. It would be no use anyway. The park never has to face legal issues. It's always been like that, he said. I listened intently. I'm very sorry for, for that, all of that. 
I hope you're doing all right, I asked. Joshua then smiled softly. Always have been. Of course, it wasn't easy at first. It still isn't. But I don't know. I'm just glad to be alive, you know. It could have been much, much worse, he said. Well, he had seemed cheerful at first. He was now looking rather sad, and I instantly felt bad for making him retell his experience. Maybe he hadn't wanted to after all. I just decided to drop it. You said something interesting earlier, that Dale took over his father's job. I didn't know that. Is the whole Park family run, by any chance? I asked. Joshua then let out a sigh. You bet. If Dale ever mentions upper management to you, he's talking about his aunts, his uncles, and his grandparents. All of that, he said. You're kidding me, I replied, with my eyes wide. How do you know? I asked. I did some research back then. I was curious, just like you and your friends. You know, I think Dale never mentions it because him and his folks don't want us to know that the park is a family matter. I mean, usually that's just something that people know about their workplace, right? He said. Definitely, but why do you think he keeps it a secret? I asked. Joshua then frowned. My bet is that it has something to do with the monsters, but I guess that's nothing new. It all has to do with the monsters in some way, he said. He then grew silent, and the look in his eyes became contemplative. I stopped caring about the park when I lost my job there. I'll never return anyways, so what does it matter, he said. Is there anything else I should know? Anything of importance that you can tell me? I asked. Joshua then lifted his head and looked me dead straight in the eyes. Just one thing, hun. I want you to be careful. While I think it's great that someone actually seems to be making progress in their investigations of the park for once, Lord knows how many have failed. We can't say for sure where this will go. Stick to the facts, and only the facts. Proceed with an open mind. Do not be too suspicious of someone who might seem like bad news to you. You never know when they might save your ass, he said. I then took a deep breath. I think Dale might be turning people into pretenders, I blurted out. The man next to me regarded me with silent interest. I then swallowed and went on. My co-workers and I talked to some of the non-actors. Well, we tried to anyway. We have reason to believe that they might have been, you know, normal people at some point in time. Okay, considering what you said earlier, it would probably be Dale's whole family who turned them and not only him. But do you think that could be where they came from? I asked. That is quite an accusation, dear. Do you really think Dale's family would have a reason to do such things? Joshua asked sternly. Maybe it's about money, I argued. The people don't visit the park to see the pretenders, though. Sure, having actors and all that makes for a more unique and fun experience, but I doubt they are the main source of its income, he said. He had a point. Well, it doesn't have to be about money, then. Maybe it's some other reason that we don't know yet. Do you know someone from the park by the name of Laurel, by chance? I asked, to which Joshua frowned and shook his head no. All right, I guess that's all then. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sure you weren't too keen on talking to me in the first place, I said. Joshua's friendly smile then returned. Don't be silly, dear. I really wanted to meet the new tamer. And tell Darius I said hi, okay? He said. On my way home, I took some time to think about what he had said. I remembered my first days on the job, how it all weirded me out so much. At first, I could hardly believe any of the things that I was so suddenly confronted with were actually happening. From one second to the next, I was standing in this strange, surreal land 
of candy, glamour, sand, and spook, holding a leash attached to something that I had never thought I would ever encounter outside the realm of my nightmares. I don't know when exactly I got used to it all. Maybe it began when I met my colleagues and befriended them, or when I started to think of Mr. Scratch as my pet. Anyways, at some point, I must have stopped feeling scared of it all. I wondered if it had been the same with Joshua when he had first started to work at the park. Of course, I still went into work later on that day. My conversation with the former tamer had put me into a bit of a melancholy mood. I was feeling quite tired, but someone has to feed the fluffy monster. Plus, I had made a mental note to myself to try and talk to Nathan. I think he knows more than he's letting on. When I arrived at the park, it somehow felt even more empty and deserted than usual. I slid in through the employee entrance as always and made my way over to the break room where the sock puppet is currently lodging. The undead nurse is still locked in Mr. Scratch's cage. I already told Darius that this is no permanent solution and that he, at some point, will have to let her out again, but he was understandably reluctant to do so. I think he's still a bit shaken from the incident with the key. I have therefore allowed him to use the cage one more day, meaning that he will have to set her free again tomorrow. I promised him that I would be there with him, so I would be able to help him in case she would lash out at him again. I have this weird feeling that it's going to be extremely fun. After feeding and petting Mr. Scratch a little bit, I decided to look for the stagecoach. To my surprise, the sock puppet seemed to set aside his laziness for me, seeing as he followed me to the Wild West section. Fortunately, Nathan was just steering the stagecoach past the entrance of Twin Bell Point when we arrived. I hurried to run after him. Nathan! I called out. Wait! The drumming of hooves on the ground came to a stop. When I caught up with the stagecoach, I noticed a familiar figure perched on top of its roof. Not sure who to address first, I motioned for Nathan to give me a moment. The cowboy was staring down at me with a void look in his eyes. He looked thoughtful. I remembered thinking that I had never seen him like this before. I blinked up at him, using my hand to shield my eyes from the light of the setting sun. He wasn't smiling or showing his teeth, and for once, there was no black saliva dripping from the corners of his mouth. If I squinted, I could almost ignore the large deformity in his upper lip. For a moment, a very short moment, he looked almost like a completely ordinary person. Hey, I said, not sure how else to greet him. He did not react. He merely continued to stare at me blankly. Um, yeah, about yesterday. I didn't mean to upset you. I don't know what it was exactly that got you so angry or sad or whatever, but it really wasn't my intention, I said. Swallowing my apprehension, I cleared my throat and asked, <clears throat> Are we good then? He seemed to think for a few seconds before he bit his lip and nodded. Good, I muttered. That's, that's a relief, I said. His lips curled ever so slightly, and I let go of a breath that I didn't know I was holding. Walking up to Nathan, I greeted him politely. The stench of his blanket hit me instantly, and I tried not to wrinkle my nose at it. I was wondering if I could ask you some questions, I explained. Nathan then looked at me then over at Mr. Scratch, who was standing by my side. Try it, he said, in that low, husky voice of his. See if I answer. Okay, I said, as I bit my lip. I then thought for a little while. Um, what do you know about the park? I asked. That's a very vague question, Nathan replied. I know a whole lot of things about the park, but... I don't think they'll be of any use to you, he said. 
He almost sounded like he was mocking me. He glanced up at the roof of the carriage, where the cowboy was still sitting, watching us intentively. Maybe I don't even want to tell you, he said. But, I started, my voice trailing off as he motioned for me to back up. If I were you, I'd get away from the stagecoach. Now, the sun is about to set, he said. A thin smile that I had never seen on him before began to spread on his lips, and he cracked his tongue. Giddy up, he called out, cracking the reins. The horses neighed loudly before dashing off down the street. The laughing cowboy held on to the edge of the roof, starting to cackle joyously as the carriage set into motion. I was left there alone with the sock puppet staring after them. Later at home, I attempted to search the name that the diva had given us, Laurel. In short, my search yielded no valuable results. There were no missing person cases from anyone by that name in this area or anything like that, or at least I couldn't find any. All in all, while Dale is still very, very suspicious in my opinion, I want to heed Joshua's advice and proceed with an open mind. After all, I have not forgotten about the key yet either, and who knows where this will lead us. I guess it's best to be ready for just about anything at this point.